I can imagine it's been pretty crazy the last couple of months for you guys. You know what? It has because it's, um, and especially, I want to say about two weeks ago too, because it's just like, you know, it, it's basically to the point where it's like, man, it, it's like, it's never ending news. Not that we, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't want to sit there and go, oh, we want the news to stop. But at the same time, it's like, we'll get good news. And then something falls apart. And then earlier in the year with the with the Kingsbury thing and all that stuff, it was it was something else. It's like at the point where you're just like, all right, when is week one? Let, let's get to game previews. Exactly. <laughs> with that in mind, what's up, everyone? Welcome into episode 70 of the Two Stripes podcast, the podcast that covers everything happening in the world of college football. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host. Before we get into today's episode, make sure to find the show on Spotify. Search the Two Straps Podcast and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. Just search the Two Straps Podcast, and you can subscribe, leave a review, and find all of the shows there. Also on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash Two Straps Pod. But as you can hear, we're already into today's episode, and that is going to be talking about the USC Trojans with one of the editors over at Conquest Chronicles, SB Nation's USC blog, and that is Matt Lauer. He's also the co-host of the Chron- Conquest Chronicles podcast. <laughs> easy for me to say, man. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Hey, Conquest Chronicles is not easy. Is not an easy thing to say, especially when you're trying to put it together. So. I feel you on that, but I'm, I'm doing pretty good today. Yeah, a lot of Q's and H's in there. Uh, but we we talked just a little bit about how crazy this last year plus for USC has been. And there's so many things, you know, you could do an hour, two hour podcast, which I'm sure you guys have done just based off of the stuff that's happened in the last year. But they go five and seven last season in Clay Helton's third year. And then the off season happens and... Like, all hell breaks loose. Lin Swan gives him a vote of confidence that he's staying, but he needs to switch up the staff. He hires Cliff Kingsbury to come on as OC. Cliff Kingsbury goes and takes the head coach job for the Arizona Cardinals. They bring in Graham Harrell. Everything with the transfer portal. It, it just feels like, like we said earlier, it's almost to the point where we're still two and a half months away from the season. But for fans... And probably the people inside the program, it's just like, let's get to fall camp and let's play that week one game. Yeah, it's um, it, it's been a pretty, uh, it's been a pretty crazy year for USC. Honestly, I mean, as you mentioned, it, it you know, as as you mentioned, you, you had the kill, uh, the Cliff Kingsbury thing. Then he leaves after thirty days to go take the Arizona Cardinals coaching job. Again, understandable because it's an NFL job, but just the things behind that was crazy. And it wasn't really a good look on Helton because it was more of why didn't you do more to keep arguably one of the the hottest coaches on the market? Why didn't you do more to keep him at USC? And then you had uh, the the whole recruiting thing with Brew McCoy leaving after two weeks due to Kingsbury leaving. Then you had top recruits basically going, you know what, I don't know what's going on at USC. And this is despite them uh, putting together a pretty good coaching staff. Then you hire Graham Harrell, getting the, um, you get in the, to summer, in the spring camp. You have two more transfers with Bellis Jones and Greg Johnson. Greg Johnson decides, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and come on back. Everything you start hearing is now good at USC. Then Chris Steele and Brew McCoy, they come to USC, or in McCoy's case, come back to USC. It's just been a wild roller coaster. And again, it's just more of what can we see come week one right now? I I think I can say this, the vibe around USC with the program and and I believe with the fans, and and I I don't know, I'm not quite 100% sure with 100% sure with the fans. Because you never know with them. But I feel the vibe around USC going into this season is a lot better than what it was three months ago. And I know you recently wrote about that, that despite everything that's happened, that there have been some positives the last few months. Do you feel like things are kind of heading in the right direction, at least as we creep towards fall camp? 
I think it is. And um, the reason why I believe that, as I wrote in the um, in the article, was that there is a huge unknown around USC. USC just went five and seven the previous season, which is the worst we've seen since 2000, 2000, 2001, before the Pete Carroll era started. Um, and so there's a uh, there's a huge amount of, of uncertainty around the program. Nobody knew what was going to happen to Clay Hilton. We kind of still don't know what's going to happen. Um, the coaching staff was just in change. You know, nobody knew what was happening. You get Kingsbury coming. Now there's some excitement. Well, Kingsbury leave. Now there's like, what the heck's going on with this program? You got players who are already there transferring out. USC had almost nine players transfer out the program. Um, but when spring camp hit, when you saw what Graham Harrell was going to do with this offense, when you saw what everybody, what the game plan was, the different voices um, with the new coaches that are there. When you saw all of that at spring camp, there was a lot of optimism. And when people started going to practices, they saw that there was change. It was different. And it was a positive di change, you know. There were, it was more intense. It was more attention to detail. It was more competition. Nobody looked stagnant. Nobody looked like, oh, my job is safe. I don't have to really do much. You know, it was, a fre it was just a fresh start at USC. And I think people saw that. And that's what turned everything around. People... Uh, and people and guys who are transferring and recruits wanted to be a part of that. It's interesting, too, because as much fun as Cliff Kingsbury would have been at USC and just to see not only everything on the field and how different that would have been for them, but what a circus it would have been off the field and Cliff Kingsbury being in L.A. would have just been hilarious. Um, Graham Harrell is a guy that I really like. He did a he did a pretty good job at North Texas in his couple of seasons there. Is this going to be his offense, or how, how much of a departure is what he's going to do for USC? This is this is going to completely be his offense. Um, I, Helton already said that this is going to be his offense, and I know that was the worry. I, I, I understood that was the big worry because Clay Helton kind of took some control with the offense and what he wanted to run. However, T. Martin was a first-year offensive coordinator. So Helton kind of had to put his hand in there and stuff. If there's any indication of what this is going to be with Graham Harrell, it's going to be, a comp it's going to be the air raid. Although, uh, although Harrell said it's not extensively the air raid as people think, it's going to be the air raid, as people think. It's um, there. It's going to be playing the USC strengths, making plays, uh, get, putting the ball in the playmaker's hands and letting them make plays. Basically, just letting them play football. It's not trying to out scheme your opponent or anything. It's just straight up go out, play football, make plays. That's that. It's that simple. And I think the the players were so shocked uh, during spring camp, as I've read. There's, they were shocked at how simple it was. And that's basically what USC needs. They don't need to reinvent the wheel or anything. They just need to take advantage of what playmakers they have or what talent they have on that side of the ball. So it's going to be it's gonna be uh, Graham Harrell's offense through and through. Helton already said he has no hand in the offense. He's just going to be a game manager. He can truly play be a head coach. He can take that Ed Orgeron role that you see at LSU where he can just manage the game and not really be involved in one aspect of the football, which is something that he needed to do. It may seem like as an outsider watching USC, and this happens at every single school, but for me, more them than anyone else in particular, like you see these top level skill players come in as high four stars or, or five stars and then three years into their career, you're looking at a depth chart and you're like, oh yeah, that that guy, I remember he was really good. He's still at USC. He's like the third string running back now. It feels like just getting them a very simple offensive system where it's just like, look, we're going to get you guys the ball in space. Here's what you're going to do. Go out there, feel the game and do your thing. It feels like maybe more so than any other offense in the country, USC needs that. 
Yes, they do. Um, and this is something that I've actually wanted them to embrace uh, last season, actually, because of the talent they had at, at wide receiver. But it was kind of hard to do because it was kind of hard to do because of a you had a true freshman quarterback and you're asking him to make plays. They were asking him to make plays with the offense that they were running. They were trying to get him to make plays like Sam Darnold was making plays. Um, but the difference is that Sam Darnold basically knew how to improvise. Sam Darnold had an escapability to him where he could get out the pocket and make plays. And now you got to respect his running ability on top of his, his, you know, his passing ability. USC hasn't had a quarterback like that. I don't think they've really ever had a quarterback like that who could make plays both on his feet and, and with his arm. JT Daniels could not do that. Um, and he was a true freshman. He was only 18, 19 years old. And you're asking him to take responsibility for a, off, for a college offense that early. Um, but I, I, if you've seen what USC did during, the, uh, during that season when Clay Helton took over, you saw when USC started throwing the ball with, with – one, two drop steps, get the ball out your hands. That's where they were moving the ball. That's when they were making plays because they weren't allowing Daniels to hold the ball, scan the field for like three to four seconds, and then have to make a play and there's nothing open. And he has to overthink and he's making bad passes. Now he can make one, two simple reads, find a, a receiver in space, or give him a quick, um, give him some uh, uh, quick bubble screens. And now let the let the receivers or let the running backs make their play. That's what they needed. And honestly, the offense operates better that way. Is he still QB1 heading into his sophomore season? Or is there going to be a quarterback competition that takes place in fall camp? There's going to be a quarterback competition. Um, all positions are open based off of what the coaches are saying. Um, the, with, with who's going to be starting week one, that's the debate right now. If you had to play a game, I think Dina and I talked about this on our uh, on a podcast maybe a, a three weeks ago. If you had to start a game, if you had to play a game and you needed to start a quarterback that week, who would you go with? Right now, money would be on JT Daniels. However, can't really sleep on on Jack Sears. Jack Sears. You know, I know a lot of people are are talking about his Arizona State game where he was efficient. And he was making play. You know, he was he was efficient. He wasn't really turning the ball over or anything like that. He was smart with with his decisions. A lot of people, you know, they see that. But in practice, he still is battling inconsistency. The thing that Harold likes about him is when a game happens, he makes plays. And that's what he likes. Uh, uh, you have Keaton Slovis, the true freshman who enrolled early. I think with Matt Fink coming back, I don't see him taking a starting job, though he's been he impressed during this uh, during spring practice. And Matt Fink, Matt Fink actually have, has not been doing too bad in spring as well. But I anticipate when uh, summer hits, I anticipate JT Daniels being the starting quarterback come um, come week one against Fresno State, though that could change. He's got some very talented options out wide with. Tyler Vaughns, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Michael Pittman out wide. It feels like this is going to be the staple of their offense. And if you're breaking in this Graham Harrell system, all three of those guys are going to get a ton of opportunities. Yeah, and not only that, with the air raid too, it requires rotation at receiver. No, though the uh, the depth could change at receiver. You had Tyler Vaughn, or not Tyler Vaughn, you had a, a um, Bellis Jones, who just returned back out of the, out of the transfer portal, uh, Kyle Ford was just cleared was cleared not too long ago for uh, for summer and and fall camp. So it will, it remains to be it remains to be seen how healthy he's going to be. But if he looks pretty good, look for him to be in that rotation. Also, right now the big unknown is Brew McCoy because. He just transferred back, and nobody knows if he's going to be eligible right away or not. I I don't anticipate him being eligible right away. I don't see the NCAA granting his waiver, letting him play right away. 
But the three names you mentioned, uh, uh, Bonds, Pittman, and St. Brown, those are the three key guys, and they will all be in there at the same time. Defenses have to figure out how are you going to cover them? How are you going to cover all of them? You know, because one's going to get loose. All of them are going to get the ball in their hands. All of them have ways of playing, too. But uh, another guy we're also forgetting, too, is, is, uh, is Devin Williams as well. You know, Devin, uh, Devin Williams, he, he impressed the last few games that he played of last season. He could be an X factor, too, because he brings size and speed. So there's a lot of talent with, with the receiver group that they can go five wide and just start slinging the ball. And we can't forget tight ends as well. But they got so many pass catchers that you that USC is going to make it tough for opponents to really cover them. I mean, that again, it's going to be a tough schedule. It remains to be seen. But I think. I think you'll see a heavy rotation at receiver and you'll see a lot of you'll see certain guys step up and and make their mark in this offense. I'm very excited to watch how Michael Pittman plays in this offense. He is a guy that I remember watching pretty closely when Ohio State played USC in the Cotton Bowl a couple of seasons ago and he didn't have a massive game or anything. He had just come off a torch in Stanford pretty good in the Pac-12 title game. And even though they had uh, Stephen Mitchell, Vaughns was ahead of him in receiving that year, and Deontay Burnett had 1,000 yards, I remember thinking, like, wow, this this guy's a star. He's the best receiver they have. And he was a bit up and down last season. But he's, just as an outsider, he's a guy that I definitely have my eye on as somebody that could really thrive in this offense. Yes, Michael. Uh, the thing with Michael Pittman is that he's get, he's getting better and better. And him coming back is huge for USC, and it's also huge for him because he can also build up his draft stock. Um, again, you have a guy who is, you know, who sits there at, at 6'4". You know, all you got to do is throw the ball up there, and he's going to come down with it. Um, he He's going to – he's going to – I think he's going to have a huge year. A lot of people are not really – well, not I don't want to say a lot of people, but he's not really talked about as much as uh, Amon Ross St. Brown or Tyler Vaughns. He's not the flashy type of receiver, but he's going to get the job done. He's that big body receiver that, you know, that you need. If you look at when USC went to the Rose Bowl, look at how many big body receivers they had. Daquan Hampton, who was who sat at 6'3", 6'4". Darius Rogers, who sat, who sat at 6'1", 6'2". Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, who sat at 6'1", 6'2". Those are three receivers right there who, who sat at at least six foot or taller. Those are guys, those are guys there who all, all Darnold had to do was throw the ball up to them, and they're going to come down with it. They're just going to make plays. So that was the big thing is that now with, with Pittman, you have that in him. You don't have like... It's not all flashy receivers and stuff like that. It's all guys who, all right, I need a deep ball. Throw it up to Pittman. He's going to come down with it. Same with Devin Williams, too. He's 6'2". He got crazy athleticism. These these are guys that you need, you know, these are guys that you need to come down and make plays for you when you need. So I, I anticipate Pittman's going to have a big year in this offense, and I'm very excited to see what he brings to the table. It's natural to just focus on the passing game when you're talking about the air raid, but a lot of air raid teams have had a ton of success running the ball and playing off of that passing game. What's the outlook like for the run game? Is the offensive line going to hold up a little bit better than it may have last season? What do you think is going to be the staple of this run game? They're going to pass. Basically, it's going to be a pass to open up the run, and what you're going to see is especially with the running game, with the running backs they have, they won't be completely ignored. I know people are thinking that, but they have Mike Jinks for a reason. If for people who are not very familiar with Mike Jinks, he was the he was the running backs coach at Texas Tech. He he coached the uh, what was it, DeAndre Washington? Yep, who plays for the Oakland Raiders now. DeAndre Washington, I believe, is the last thousand yard running back that Texas Tech had. Now, in an air raid, in a very pass-happy offense, you have a running back rushing for over 1,000 yards. 
that's telling you something. They have Jinx for that reason to coach up the the running backs. And when you have somebody like Stephen Carr, who we're wondering if he's going to be healthy, uh, Ve- uh, Veve Malampei, who who was out, very consistent, who was outstanding, Marquis Step, who looks very outstanding, um, and then you know you're going to have other running backs coming in as well. It's going to be a um, it's going to be huge for USC. I think the running back will find some success. How the offensive line holds up their blocks, I think it will be easier for them to get blocks, to hold up blocks, especially when you don't have players when you don't have players stacking the box or linebackers stacking the box, anticipating the run. They can open up those holes a little bit more. Maybe get those five to six yard runs to make it easy. Um, that's what we can see, but. I um, we only seen a sample size of what Graham Harrell is going to do with the running game. He did say that they will run the ball. It's not going to be like I said, it's not going to be like, oh, we're going to throw the ball 80 times a game and then forget about it and rush the ball. Maybe 10 to have 10 carries per game. You know, it's not going to be that way. It's it, it's going to be they're going to establish the run game to open it up. So. I don't think it's going to be like how it was last year. I I, I do think um, they're going to throw to open up the run, and I think that makes it easy for Malapai and Carr to get out or to get those runs that they need. One of the things about USC that really stands out is that by their standards, last year's defense wasn't very good, and that may be due to youth, injuries, whatever it is, but this season – all of that youth comes back and the depth that came about through those injuries is all still there. And it, it feels like they're so super young on defense and maybe we don't know what they're going to be right now, but the pieces are there for this to be a really talented group. Yes, it is. It's, um, it, it's honestly all that talent on defense is there. Um, the freshmen are a year older so now you got a year of experience. You have guys who were uh, who switch positions. I think what Pendergast is now is making the defense simple. He simplified his defense. Um, it, it's also questions like how do you replace certain guys right now? There, you're asking the question in the secondary. Who do you who? How do you replace? Um, how do you replace uh, uh, Iman Marshall? Well, you 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 have Greg Johnson, who I mentioned earlier. You have Elijah Griffin, who, you know, youth, his youth show, but the potential is there for him to be a lockdown corner. Isaiah Tyler Stewart, who is going to be playing this year, you don't know what he can do. You know, it it, it could be he looks amazing one day, and then it's like his youth shows another day, but. He could also be a, a potential guy. Chase Williams is somebody who everybody needs to keep an eye on in that secondary. And then at linebacker, you have um, a lot of guys switching positions. You have a lot of guys switching positions. Uh, you 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 move. Excuse me. You move John Houston to the wheel. You know, so that way uh, Gail Teote could could play the inside, which is better for him. It's better for him that way. Um, you have you, you have Rector moving the outside linebacker or the predator linebacker position or whatever it's going to be called now. Um, you have him there. I mean, it's it's just now they there has to be they made it simple. They switched position. They move guys in positions to play to their strengths. They have new um, coaches on the defensive side of the ball. And and um, and Chad K, who's the defensive line coach, who was at Boise State, and Ronnie Bradford coming back to coach the secondary. It's just how again, how will it come together defensively? How will it work defensively? How do they make those? How do they fix up those mistakes? I think if they simplify it, the player it will help the players a lot more, especially with them when they're to different positions. What's going to be the strength of this defense? You think the defensive line. Um, we've heard I've heard so much good about the defensive line that I think that will be the strength of this team. Um, just them getting the ability. It, it's I think they'll have the ability to rush the the quarterback more to get into the backfield. 
You have Rector now as, as a stand-up edge rusher, um, which, which, again, is easier for him. The line, I think the line slimmed down a little bit. I, I believe the line slimmed down just a little bit, according to, to uh, uh, Chad K. Um, I, that's gonna, I feel that's going to be the strength of this team, honestly. I think that will be the most consistent strength of the team. I would say the linebackers, especially when you have Gail Teote there, but I, I have some things. I want to see what Rector does at uh, outside linebacker as a rusher. I want to see what um, I want to see what Ios, uh, what Iosefa and, and, Ma, and Mauga. I want to see what those guys can do too. Uh, how they step in and and affect the game as well. And the secondary just has. I have questions for the secondary right now. For the and I can't say they're the strength. Although them having Chris Steele and if he if he's eligible immediately, he could play a huge uh, factor on the secondary. But again, the health and the depth at corner and the experience at, and in the youth. At, I don't want to say the youth, but the the uh, um, the game time experience is something I want to see, and the consistency is something I want to see. So, looking at the schedule, there isn't like a lot of powerhouses in terms of teams that you think are going to challenge for the college football playoff or anything but especially in the first six weeks there's fresno state stanford at byu utah at washington at notre dame it's filled with just really solid teams that at the very least do one thing really well and it feels like we're going to get a pretty good read on usc straight from the jump as they compare to the rest of the pac-12 yes uh i i agree with that honestly it's um <laughs> And I have a sigh about this, too, because, and Dina and I always talk about this, it seems like USC is always, always, always having a tough schedule. They're always getting the short end of the stick with the schedules. And USC tends to schedule tough, too. They they tend to schedule stuff, uh, tough, but the Pac-12, and the way they do their schedule, does not do them any favors. Fresno State, I, I don't think... And this could be me. I don't think Fresno State is as daunting as as people think. And the reason I say that is because yes, they won ten games and they won the Mountain West, but they're breaking in a new quarterback too. They're breaking in a new quarterback. They're breaking in new players at certain positions. Uh, they're 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 fixing up their defense. Who I believe their defense lost quite a few too. So they're. It, I, it's just the fact that I don't see that as a daunting game. I mean, if you look at the offense, if you look at Fresno State's offense, they return two players, two starters. They're returning two starters. So I don't think it's as daunting as people think. You never know with those things, you know, with the first game of the season. Um, but yeah, after that, Stanford, BYU, Utah, you're looking at three physical games. And I, and if you've ever heard of the body blow, if you heard of body blow theory, that's really going to take into effect those three games because they play Stanford and Stanford's always a physical game in the trenches. For years, we've known that's been that that's been known to be a, a very physical game. So they have that. Then they go to BYU and Provo. Provo is not an easy place to play. Despite BY, you know, despite what you think of BYU or anything, that's not an easy team to play because they're also physical. Then they have a short week and they got to play Utah on a Friday night. By that time, you don't know what condition that te this team is going to be. We don't know what condition that team is going to be by the time they hit Utah. And that, I feel, is going to be a, a tough one. You know, because let's say, for instance, they go three and zero heading into Utah. Then you gotta. Then after that, after that, they kind of get an extended break. Then you get Washington. You you have the um, you get the Huskies at Husky Stadium. Now, some people think that's not going to be a tough game. Actually, they think that's a winnable game. Believe it or not, I I. I I, for whatever reason, I kind of don't see it, but uh, people think that that's a winnable game. 
I kind of see Notre Dame as a winnable game. And granted, they just went to the college football playoff, but I think USC is due to win a game in South Bend. And especially if you looked at the last game, how USC played the Irish close, I seriously think that this is a game where USC could get over the edge and beat the Irish. So, I don't know. It's it's a tough schedule on paper, but at the same time, there are some games that make you go, you know what, maybe this isn't as daunting as you think. But it's still going to be a hard schedule for the, for the first six games. And in that three-game slate with Stanford, BYU, and Utah, that could tell the story right there. So last question for you, and we've managed to basically avoid the pratfall of just talking about what it's going to take for Clay Helton to keep his job or not. So I'll just ask you, what's a successful season for USC in 2019? A successful season for USC in 2019 will be eight win, eight or nine wins and winning the Pac-12 South. I think that will be a – and the reason why I say winning the Pac-12 South is because the Pac-12 South is a very – it's wide open and it's winnable. It's very wide open and it's very winnable, despite what people think, because you don't know what teams are gonna, you don't know what teams are gonna step up. You don't know what teams are gonna, are going to be there and go. Okay, we're gonna take over the South. USC still has the talent to win the South, and I think it comes down to that Utah game. If they win that Utah game, they can win the South, but. Um, eight wins, I mean, I don't want to set the bar low at seven wins because I feel like this team can, uh, with the offensive change and all of that, I feel like this team can win more. I don't think they go six and six or worse. I don't see that. I, I can't see that. But um, successful would be eight wins. That's, that's what it's going to take for Clay to keep his job, uh, in all honesty. Well, if the first five-plus months – or if the next five plus months are anything like the first five plus months of this year, then it's going to be pretty crazy for USC and there's never any shortage of stories about that. And if you want to keep up with everything that happens leading up to their 2019 season as it begins, be sure to visit conquestchronicles.com. Also follow them on Twitter at C Chronicles SBN. You can catch all of Matt's work there. Listen to him on the Conquest Chronicles podcast. Matt, where else can they find you? You can also find me on Twitter at um, at Matt A. Lowry. Just be, you can be sure to follow me there. Um, always talking USC football and USC basketball as well. So feel free to, to reach out to me on there and um, and yeah like like what Colton said you can uh, also you can follow us at C Chronicles SBN on Twitter as well yeah it should be very fun to follow USC this season make sure to follow Matt make sure to follow Conquest Chronicles for everything happening in USC this season Matt thanks for joining the show man that was a lot of fun oh thank you for having me I, I really appreciate it and I enjoyed it USC fans, if you are looking to kill some time this weekend, I would highly encourage you to head on over to youtube.com slash Colton Denning, go to the video section, scroll down a little bit, and you will see two videos that I think will pique your interest. And that would be the highlights of one Mike Williams and Dwayne Jarrett from when they were at USC. Both of these videos are over 12 minutes long and they are ridiculous. So USC fans, and I guess college football fans in general, if you like great college football players, head on over there. Watch those two highlight videos now that we're already talking about USC. And stay on the page and watch all the other good stuff I got on there. There's CJ Spiller. There's Ed Reed. I recently put up Jamal Charles. Peter Warwick at Florida State. There's all kind of good stuff. Old college football highlights and the podcast over on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Also, if you like today's show, please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts. Leave me some feedback. I am on Twitter, at DubsCo, and you can also follow along with the show on Spotify. Just go to your podcast section, search the Two Stripes Podcast, and every new episode that I drop will populate there. You don't have to 
do any other searching for it. It'll all come up there, and you can keep up with the show right on Spotify. That's the easiest way to do it. Thank you to Matt once again for joining the show. He's going to have a very fun year. Maybe not fun for him if it goes bad, but a very interesting year covering USC football because as we talked about in the episode, if the young guys gel on offense and Graham Harrell turns out to be what I think is going to be a pretty good hire at offensive coordinator, then they could be an explosive offense and be a lot of fun to watch. But on the flip side... If it doesn't work out, if the guys are still too young on offense, the defense doesn't gel like we kind of think it will, then you're talking about USC hiring another head coach, everything blowing up, and having to start all over again. So either way, I think it's going to be very entertaining watching USC this season and seeing where they stack up in the Pac-12 South, which is pretty in flux right now. There, There isn't a clear-cut contender maybe other than Utah and everyone else has a lot of major questions and USC is always that team that if for lack of a better phrase they have their shit together they should win the Pac-12 South so it's only a matter of months before we find out but I am very excited to see what happens with USC's season this year that's going to wrap up today's episode I want to thank you for listening if you're a first-time listener I hope you enjoyed it I hope you stick around for the podcast And I hope you're around for the 2019 college football season. I got a lot of fun stuff coming up next week. I've never done a solo episode, but these interviews are so hard to lock down when you're trying to build the podcast up that I'm going to do a solo episode next week and talk about some of the stuff that I am interested in watching in college football this next season. Stuff that may be a little bit off the radar. You know, I'm not going to talk anything Alabama or Clemson, whether Tua or Trevor Lawrence is going to win the Heisman, but some other stuff that I am looking for for this season and that I'm looking forward to. So I hope you stick around for next week's show. But until then, my name is Colton Denning, and this is the Two Stripes Podcast.